These are the top 10 gaming controversies of 2012. No, they're not. Yes, they are. No, they're not. Yes, they are. No, they're not. Yes, they fucking are! Number 10. Tomb Raider and Hitman Marketing Campaigns After the Crossroads trailer for Tomb Raider went live on the internet, many viewers became fixated on a scene in which Laura is being handled against her will with her hands tied behind her back. Others argued that that's ridiculous, that it's no big deal, that it was taken out of context, such a small part of the game. Lara Croft is one of the most iconic heroines in video game history. In this reimagining, we go back to the very beginning to tell an origin story that takes the player on an incredible journey to discover how she becomes a Tomb Raider. <sighs> However, the fallout really got underway when an interview with Crystal Dynamics executive producer Ron Rosenberg avoided answering if Laura was being raped and instead talked about showing her developing as a character from it, stating that players will feel that Laura needs to be protected and even that women don't project themselves into Laura as a hero character at all. The uproar that followed quickly escalated with many decrying using rape as a female character development tool, causing Crystal Dynamics to make a new statement directly contradicting the interview. Lead writer Rihanna Pratchett stated that there is some of me in her. She's very focused. She's very in her head. Pratchett says, after having been a past student of Egyptology and archery herself, this has fueled continued discussion over the possible sexism and treatment of female character development within the games industry as a whole. I've always been a huge fan of, of kick-ass females. I mean, I grew yeah. up on Terminator and aliens. Yeah. You know, fighting aliens in the future. I thought that was what girls did. As for the Hitman series, it has also been no stranger to stirring up controversy in the hopes of increasing sales. From the old, beautifully executed promotional ads and magazines to the more recent Attack of the Saints trailer, with gun wielding nuns wearing latex and teddies without bothering to explain or give any context at all. Then came the Facebook promotional ads, which allowed users to place virtual hits on their friends by using descriptive words such as small tits, small penis, bad odor. The outcry quickly brought down the ad with Square Enix making a formal apology for the entire mess. Many accused these practices as intentional, specifically designed to get as much bad press to further promote the game while outweighing the possible negative side effects that the ad would cause. Many would argue that the marketing for both Hitman and Tomb Raider have made some serious errors. Number 9. And every time I try to log in, I get fucking error 37! Error 37! I keep trying to log in and I get error 37! Error 37! Why the fuck is it 37? What the fuck are the other 36? Shouldn't this be error number 1? Error number 1, I can't log the fuck in! Error 37. I spent all fucking night trying to get this goddamn collector's edition. I stood in line at fucking Walmart. I can barely stand up. I fucking stood in line. I just can't even play the fucking game. Didn't we all enjoy playing the widely anticipated, highly sought after Error 37? By Blizzard, this engaging and satisfying game proved that always online DRM can lead to a fantastic user experience. Okay, enough of this bullshit! Fail! 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 
This is one situation where the gaming community called it before it even happened. A majority of fans were upset and concerned that Blizzard's choice of always online DRM in Diablo 3 would affect the game poorly and they were 100% right. Rejected connections displayed the now infamous error 37 message. Angry gamers took to the forums to rage. The always online requirement meant that in order to even play the game, Blizzard's servers would have to be working in tip top shape. Certainly they weren't. That's not even counting the plethora of in-game issues, disappointments, exploits, auction house woes, and the promise of PvP system that has still not yet been delivered. After David Brevik, co-creator, spoke out about Diablo saying, quote, Some of the decisions they had made are not the decisions I would make, and there have been some changes in philosophy, and that hasn't gone over very well. I think in that way, I am a little sad. The other devs chimed in on Facebook to David's words, to which the game director Jay Wilson then responded to, quote unquote, fuck that loser, later apologizing in a lengthy post on the Diablo 3 site. Was it really that wrong of him to speak out about a game that's had that many issues? This is bullshit! This is bullshit! I paid money, cash money, dollar money, cash money! Fuck! <laughs> <laughs> Number 8 Well, that- what the hell? Well, someone ex- is that a person? That is actually a person, right? Yeah, alright, so this person is a mysterious floating backpack and is killing me. Well, this game is fantastic. The War Z Scandal. The War Z has been no stranger to controversy. From the bully tactics of its developers to the other broken launch of a clearly unfinished game on Steam, War Z stinks bad. After the rise in popularity of Daisy, a mod for Arma 2, many claim Warzy attempted to cash in, racing to public consumption half cocked but with full microtransaction and purchases perfectly well intact. What then followed was a justified consumer backlash to the very real false advertising and misinformation presented in the Steam store page. Users finding the terms of service even copied word for word from the game League of Legends and various bully tactics by the developers on their forums banning anyone that raised complaints. It got so bad that actual reps for the company blackmailed paying customers seeking refunds. This has led to Steam pulling the game for sale and offering refunds for anyone that bought it. Just what the hell was Hammerpoint Interactive thinking? Still, many defend the game as quote unquote fun and that it's no big deal. Why broken games in this state are accepted by some just boggles my mind. That's that's truly wonderful. What a, what a great game this is. All right. Number seven. And then make it exclusive to just a console that doesn't even exist yet and say that you're doing it to bring the game into hands and hands of more and more gamers. That doesn't make any sense. It's fucking bullshit. And now, if I don't want to buy a Wii U, I'm not going to be able to play the, se the fucking sequel. No! 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 Bayonetta 2. Wii U exclusive. Bayonetta was a much-loved beat-em-up game that received praise from many reviewers and gamers and led to speculation on a sequel to its crazy world. However, once the sequel was finally announced, it was announced to be a Wii U exclusive. The fans' outrage quickly began to boil. The world over, we would never dream of alienating them from participating in future games. Then why are you putting it on one console? This is so much fucking bullshit! This press release oozes bullshit! This led to several petitions and pleading 
to the developers to bring Bayonetta 2 to the gamers that played the original, to the consoles where it originated. It also marks the first time that a sequel will be placed on a different console company than the first installment, leaving many out in the dust unless they convert. This incident could easily be higher on the list on the anger factor if not for the fact that the developers brought to light that Nintendo had offered to pay for development. Bayonetta 2 simply would not exist, but it still stings to everyone who loved Bayonetta and who have no plans of getting a Wii U. What if I don't want a Wii U? Hey, did you ever think of that? Did you ever think about what if I don't want a Wii U? Number six. Well, as if that is an insult enough, guess what? They're all on the console versions again, and we're gonna be paying for them twice! Capcom Cody, DLC Guy, on Sakura, disc Saga. Dunda, Dudley, Alina, Christy, Lee, Alyssa, Lars, Jack X, Brian, Mega Man, and fucking Pac Man! Arguably starting long before this year, this saga, Capcom's terrible decision making with regards to DLC practices continue. The last straw came with Street Fighter Cross Tekken with a full expanded roster of characters locked on the disc that many had already paid for. In fact, Mega Man is even on the Xbox disc but will never be available, only to hackers. Capcom then promised to quote unquote reevaluate their DLC practices in the future. Downloadable content, content that you download, not shit already on the disc. See? Why is it so different? However, saying that Dragon's Dogma would also have disc lock content. It was later discovered that Resident Evil 6 had on-disc DLC, but Capcom revealed that this content would be completely free. Capcom has consistently made claims that on-disc DLC is necessary. They need to put the code on the disc in order to do updates later. However, they've made false claims in the past regarding what is possible through multiplayer, as Mortal Kombat has served as a perfect example of what you can do with DLC at later dates. Clearly it's a controversial issue. The entire situation has left many gamers with a poor taste in their mouths. It remains to be seen whether Capcom can stick to their word and treat its future DLC with a bit more tact. FUCKING BULLSHIT! They're fucking lying to your face! Straight to your face! Fucking lying to you! Or this guy's an idiot! You want to know why? Oh yeah, man! Oh, well that's a good explanation, that sounds right! Except for Nether Realms on Mortal Kombat allows you to do that exact same thing! Number 5 When he's not striking out opponents on the mound, the Red Sox Kurt Schilling can be found battling enemies on the web. This is how you get around in the world when you have a couple bucks. The star pitcher loves multiplayer online games where his identity remains anonymous. 38 Studios The events that befell 38 Studios, developer of the decent kingdoms of Amalur Reckoning, were nothing short of tragic. Getting a loan from the state of Rhode Island in order to promote the game company and for the state to take pride in the work of a developer within its borders seemed to be a match made in heaven. Then it came time to pay the tab, and 38 Studios hadn't made a profit, short of even breaking even. Observers pointed to Kurt Schilling as having spent money at an insane rate without having more outside funding coming in. Schilling maintains that Rhode Island Governor Lincoln Sheffy was at the head of a quote-unquote concerted effort to make this not succeed as the governor was against the deal to bring in the company to the state in the first place. In the end, Rhode Island took control of the developer and has tied up Kurt Schillings in legal red tape ever since. Schillings believed with quote every ounce of his being that he can turn his company around in time, but that never happened. The real sad part though is how the employees were blindsided by all the dysfunction at the top levels of management. 
not getting even the promised 60 days of notice, putting them out of their jobs, and worse, some out of their homes. Does he remind you of yourself? No, gosh, no. Number 4 Sega Copyright Claims for Shining Force This one in particular is concerning as it can affect anyone who posts to YouTube. After over 15 years without copyright claim, Sega has suddenly begun to target YouTube users who had previously posted Shining Force 3 videos? And even getting their accounts banned without warning or notice. In a term that many consider highly illegal, Sega has also brought copyright injunctions using the Digital Millennium Act against videos that had no footage of Shining Force in them, and were only talking about the series as a whole. This has led to many YouTube users to outright boycott posting Sega-based products or videos, including Total Biscuit. As you might imagine, it was somewhat surprising to receive a copyright strike for a 15-year-old game. It is impossible to buy that game in any legitimate form outside of the second-hand market at this point. There have been takedowns on a wide variety of different channels, including mine. Using the DMCA system within YouTube, they have been able to take down two of my videos via copyright claims and place two copyright strikes on my account. Now, generally speaking, it's three strikes and you're out. This has also included videos that have no footage of Shining Force in them at all. Ergo, it is actually flat out illegal. That is flat out disgusting, wrong, and in many cases, actually illegal. As a direct result of this action by Sega Japan, I have boycotted all Sega products on my channel going forward until this issue is amicably resolved. Needless to say, this practice is an amazingly foolish lose-lose situation for Sega, not only making them look like complete fucking assholes, but it's been proven time and time again that people posting and sharing content about a game makes a good percentage of those watchers interested in playing and buying said game. Completely clueless, Sega. Way to go, idiots! Way to go! Aww. Hit it! Sega's next-generation gaming platform, revolutionary sports and arcade gameplay, all with amazing new 3D experiences never before possible on home game systems. Wow. Number 3 Hello, I'm Angry Joe, and this is my review of Halo 4. It's a good game, and I got plenty of bonus XP. Dorito Gate and the 2012 GMAs. Jeff Cayley's blank stare surrounded by bags of Doritos, Mountain Dew, and ad banners so perfectly capsulized what many believe the state of games journalism in general has devolved into. And uh, you know, part of what I'm talking about today is the double XP program that Mountain Dew and Doritos are bringing back, which actually allow gamers to rank up inside of war games in Halo 4 by purchasing Mountain Dew or Doritos. So that's, that's, that's all they got to do. It's that easy. It's just buy yeah. the Doritos and the Mountain Dew and then go to the website and they can get a competitive edge before the game launches next month. Yeah, it gives you a little uh, boost. You know, kind of, you know, please stay in the business. Get excited about being a game journalist because we need more great game journalists. Uh, I've had my own personal disagreements with Jeff coming to the VGAs to voice some concerns of gamers that I got questions for. Ultimately, I was unprepared, and Jeff took my inexperience and my poorly worded questions and tore them to pieces. All with that PR-style smile, like I had been brought there for a very specific reason. However, I noticed something from the other press in the room when I started asking questions. 
was thinking maybe these could be cut down and you could do a fighting game or a PC game. Or we do have a best PC game category. I'm not sure if you're familiar with that, but I go check out the website. All right, take care. <laughs> Anything else, guys? I, yo, yo, Z, yes. Now, I'm no games journalist. I've never claimed to be. I'm just a guy on YouTube who enjoys making videos and sharing my opinion. I admit it. I was totally inexperienced and out of place in, in that whole scene, and, and I don't even desire to go back. But what I noticed when I was there was a lot of ass kissing, a lot of softball questions, and snarkiness to any sort of criticism to the show. We got your alcohol, we got your buffet, we got your crackers and cheese. Just shut up and write positively. Uh, you know, please stay in the business, get excited about being a game journalist because we need more great game journalists. Uh, but what I would say is you need to find your unique angle. You need to find something that you can own as your own. And I talked to a lot of young, aspiring game journalists and you know they're, they're writing previews or they're writing a review and that's great or they're covering the news but what you really need to do is kind of find your own niche, your own little spin on gaming uh, and whether that's you know having a voice uh, and by that I mean sort of a real perspective on the gaming news that can be interesting. But one has to exercise better judgment than to be surrounded by stuff like this, especially being one of the most, if not the most, high profile actual game journalist in title within the industry today. Bribery, favors, and shady practices have forever been a topic amongst suspicious, cautious gamers and, unfortunately, misguided fanboys. However, that's not to say it doesn't exist. We've seen the GameStop firing of Jeff, the Kane and Lidge ad pulls, and now this year we've had the most recent example from the UK. For those who don't know, the GMAs, or the Game Media Awards, is a yearly function in the UK where they honor and give awards to the best editors and games journalists of the year. I think it's a brilliant event. It's wonderful that people are celebrating these things. However, they are voted for by PR and sponsored by publishers. And that right there is the whole problem. This year, they may have finally crossed the line by encouraging journos at the event to tweet with a hashtag for promoting a game with the incentive of winning a free PS3. Favors for positive coverage. So then, Mr. Florence, a Scottish writer, does a fantastic conversation starter piece on Eurogamers on the growing relationship between PR and journalists. In the article, he quotes public tweets from several journals and discusses why they might lead to questions of credibility and career integrity. In turn, Lauren Wainwright, who was quoted, in the article, threatened legal action for libel, which caused Eurogamer to remove and censor the article. In turn, Florence stepped down from the site. People criticizing the practice were then met with disdain and even mockery. Readers then discovered that Lauren had actual consulting work for Square Enix on her resume and a Tomb Raider themed Twitter background. When pressed, she quickly edited the resume and protected her tweets, saying that she only consulted and never reviewed anything by them, which again was proven wrong with her review of Deus Ex in the Sun. The threat of legal action and the defense by many of the practice show clear signs of how many games journalists in the UK and even the US may have just lost their way and are in it for the wrong reasons. The perks and the image rather than protecting consumers, critiquing games, and their publishers practices. Number 2 I was just waiting for a renegade interrupt option where I can fire a bullet right through the kid's skull. Mass Effect 3 ending. Sucked! It's been talked about nearly to death, okay? But it's quite possibly the largest community backlash to a game yet seen. My own top reasons we hated the ending outlined why it sucked so bad, and my indoctrination theory video explained and showed how desperate we were for some sort of meaning for the crap ending that we got. 
So do you believe in the indoctrination theory? Or do you think these are fans who are grasping at straws looking at Mass Effect's lore for any reason to throw out our current ending? Gamers quickly found that they had been promised from the beginning of a story whose ending would be dramatically shaped by the player choices in previous games was simply untrue. Instead, the game ended in a textbook's example of a stupid ass twist ending, with a star child coming from the crucible and literally wrapping up and solving the plot. Poorly. Not only were the three separate endings largely the same, but they actively contradicted statements made by EA and Bioware and ended the story on a sour note. Bioware quickly responded, though it did little to ease the raging firestorm that had erupted and only seemed to pour fuel on the fire. However, to Bioware's credit, they did respond in a way not many companies would. They released a free revised edition of the ending and while it may not have fixed all the issues or been the ultimate ending that everyone was hoping for kudos were earned by the company as we felt as a community we had made a positive change so it should be known that it is okay to voice your own personal opinion. Bioware isn't above criticism. Many have thought that they could do no wrong, ever. That they're the Pixar and they should never be criticized. But it's okay. Bioware does need a bit of tough love sometimes. They promised this specific thing would not happen wildly different endings things would be explained things would resolve itself maybe not in a happy way but in a final and gratifying way and that is not what happened there will be a tomorrow only if we win today number one I bet you thought you guessed my number one. Well, Mass Effect 3 would have been number one, if not for something even more controversial to pop up this year, and something very, very serious. Something that needs more awareness raised about it. Arma 3, Imprisonment. Bohemia Interactive has always prided itself on putting huge amounts of detail into its game worlds, especially in regards to the Arma series. When developers Ivan and Martin were sent to get concept pictures for use in constructing the Greek island in Arma 3, they were arrested as they were about to leave and were charged with spying for Greece's enemies. The controversy has exploded to the point where the Czech government is trying to help get its citizens back, and with much of the internet decrying Greece for its lack of common sense and its saber rattling. Others contend that they deserve imprisonment as they were taking photos of military bases, to which Master Eleven of the Escapist Forums replied, wait, this island? With these military bases? With these bomber targets? Here, have a picture of our hangars in incredibly high detail. Do you know why we don't care about pictures of our bases? Because we have these things called radar and SAMs, and because <laughs> can find satellite images of 99.9% .9 of the Earth for free, let alone buying them from companies who don't care if they're not meant to take pictures of certain areas. Why the hell would you send two random guys with a video camera to get your information? What purpose would that serve? But no, the Greek government has begun stating that the two were flagged as spies before they even landed in the country, and their few pictures and couple seconds of video were all that were needed to prove they are guilty. This is nothing but scapegoating, so the government looks like they're actually doing something, yet it's backfired because now the whole world is going to search for this mythical airbase that's super secret. A website known as HelpIvanMartin.org has been set up to help get these two home and with many asking the community at large to keep them in their thoughts. 
I think you'll agree, although Mass Effect 3 may have affected more people, the morality involved in imprisoning Ivan and Martin is far more controversial than some game ending. A government perhaps scapegoating, distracting itself from very real and serious problems that it is dealing with. And I hope that Ivan and Martin can come home safely soon. Of course, at E3 itself, visitors to the Bohemia Battle Bunker booth are encouraged to get hands-on with it all and take a look at these things in as much splendid detail as they like and at their own leisure. Well, that just about wraps up our E3 preview. I hope that raises a lot of new questions, which of course Ivan, myself, and Daisy creator Dean Hall will be more than happy to address at E3. So, if you want them answered, be sure to encourage your favourite gaming journalist to check out the Bohemia Interactive booth, where the team will also be showcasing Carrier Command and a few other surprises to boot, I'm sure. Bye for now!